Welcome this everybody, is you are tuned the to baseline, the baseline Cali discussing the hot button Jessica. topics of the NBA. NBA. In the aftermath of the NBA Finals, get your mind right. NBA draft is right upon us. And we got a lot of stuff happening, a lot of stuff to get uh, to get to break down and, and get into. And I can't wait to discuss it. I know you can't wait to discuss it. So let's get right into the NBA offseason. And you know I got to do with my right hand man, 50 grand NBA fishing out of Dime Mac contributor, right up one of the illest websites, www.shawsports.net. Big Kahuna and PNC, my brother from another mother, Mr. Warren Shaw, ripping out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Holler back at me, Mr. Shaw. Sweating bullets, man, after that NBA finals, aren't we? Absolutely, man. Salute, salute to all the fans, listeners, the NBA baseline. I feel like my intro is getting a little bit faster each week, bro. But nevertheless, you know, thank you for tuning in. We might with have us. to put you in the combine. <laughs> I mean, you should be an auctioneer or something. The, the, but, NBA, you know. <laughs> the NBA podcast combine. That's right. That's right. Oh, we should get that going. But <laughs> definitely thank you for tuning in with us. The NBA finals have concluded. We are now talking about the NBA draft and what that's going to mean for us. Another great guest coming on to help us break down some of the players that you should be getting to know in the next coming weeks, and especially with Summer League and all those things other like, like that roll around. So, my man, why don't you do the honors as always? Oh, yeah, man. And listen, in order to help us get your mind right, for this upcoming NBA draft. We have a great guest on with us in a few moments. We'll have our man Ed Isaacson from NBADraftBlog.com. He's also the brain trust for NBADraftBlog.com, and he's also a contributor for NBC Sports slash Roto World. He does big things discussing covering the NBA draft, scout, analyst, you name it. He does it. He's on top of it. We got him on here, and we can't wait to bring him on board to get you guys ready for this upcoming NBA draft. Also on our uh, segment, of the drop we'll be talking about is the nba rigged i know the r word not the l word it's the r word but yeah we're gonna drop our perspective on it sean and i we're gonna actually go into do we really feel like the nba is playing hooky with the sport that we love and then of course we got our covered coast to coast giving you the news that's happening all over the association so we got a great show lined up for you we appreciate you guys hopping on board tuning in to the nba uh, to the baseline nba podcast you know how to get at my man shaw at shaw sports nba or get at me at game face lee the show Twitter handle at NBA Baseline. We ask you hashtag up the baseline. Let us know who you are, what you're about. Available on the major platforms, available on Stitcher Radio, Microsoft TuneIn, iTunes, Player FM. Also available on Google Music. And my man Shaw's channel is on Roku, Shaw Sports, where we upload the baseline podcast. So be sure to check out the Roku Marketplace. Go to shawsports.net and you have the opportunity to listen to one of your favorite NBA podcasts, the Baseline NBA podcast, happening every single time you're tuned in. We appreciate every single one of you guys hopping on board with us. We always implore you to download and discuss, drop us comments, give us thoughts. More importantly, give us a rating. We always appreciate the ratings and also our favorite platforms appreciate the ratings as they elevate us to be your go-to resource discussing all things in the association. You know how we do, and you know how we like to set it off. It's time now for the breakdown. Time to break it down. Break it down with the bone gristle. Bone gristle. Bone gristle. Time now for the breakdown. Cal Lee, Warren Shaw of the Baseline NBA Podcast. And I know a lot of people are, are still salivating and, and, and their minds are completely fixated on the hangover regarding the NBA Finals, but we got to move forward. The NBA moves forward. And there's some talented guys that I'm sure after watching what has transpired in this NBA playoffs run cannot wait to saddle up their shoes and to continue their journey. But we know that there is definitely one person who's been eyeing the talent, who's basically been putting his perspective out there on where these guys are going to fall in line. It's our guy, Ed Isaacson. He is draft analyst, scout, and the brain trust for NBADraftBlog.com. And you can also find a lot of his articles, great write-ups regarding the NBA draft. It's on NBC Sports slash Roto World. Ed, thanks for joining us this week so we can get prepared for this week's upcoming NBA draft. Uh, No problem, guys. My pleasure. So, Ed, I want to jump right in. And, you know, for those who may not be familiar, can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, how you got involved, you know, in in, in the in scouting and, and the draft process and everything, a little bit about that, and obviously a little bit about NBADraftBlog.com. Uh, you know, the start was sort of strange. You know, I always loved basketball, always wanted to, you know, work in it. But, you know, I come from, I come from a time when, you know, it was, you know, pre-internet. You didn't know how to go about doing everything. So I followed 
a normal path. Went to school, uh, went to law school, worked in law for a bit, um, you know, but I just didn't enjoy it. Um, so as I was getting near 40, I was like, I got to do something that I want to do. And started contacting people and, and who worked in basketball about, you know, what do I do to get in? And, you know, from that, a lot of great ideas from a lot of great people in the league. Um, you know, and the scouting and the draft part was the part that always fascinated me. Uh, you know, when I started at the site, it wasn't meant to be anything. You know, I never expected anyone to read anything. It was just a place for me to sort of practice uh, and put, you know, put my work out there. Uh, but I guess people started to read and uh, it, it took off from there. And that was five, six years ago. Uh, you know, now it's something I do full time and uh, I couldn't be happier about that. Uh, and you know, my work is sort of split. NBA draft com is where I do my full scouting reports and the interviews. Um, and for NBC and Roto world, that's where you can find more of the stuff that's for more of the general audience, mock drafts and ranking lists, um, things like that, which are things I never really enjoyed doing. Um, but, you know, I see, you know, there is a need to get that kind of stuff out there. And, uh, you know, the people at NBC convinced me <laughs> that, that I should do it. And one of the things that I think is, is interesting about how draft analysts and draft scouts go about, you know, their ability to assess the talent that, that goes out there and, and maybe you can probably go a little bit more in depth on, you know, what are the important things that you look for um, aside from just the film, what these guys are doing in the combines, like specifically for yourself, what are some key things that you really feel like, you know what, Ben Simmons is definitely going to be considered a number one because of this. Um, and it's something that I know consistently up and down the line. If they're doing this correctly, this is going to put them in a very good position to be a lottery draft pick. You know, a lot of it is, you know, people think these guys come to college and that's where you sort of pick up, um, you know, who these guys are, what they're made of, what kind of player they'll be. Um, but a lot of these names, you know, Simmons included, you know, have been sort of tracking them since they were 14, 15 years old. Uh, so you see what the growth is like. Um, and, you know, having a bit, you know, the development curve for these guys is not something that is set in stone. Everyone doesn't follow the same. So you sort of have to have a general idea of where they were, where they are now, and where they're likely to end up. And when, when you sort of get that intersection of guys who still have a lot of room left on the development curve, uh, it, well, when that meets the, you know, where they have a high skill level already, that's when you start talking about lottery guys, uh, you know, guys who, ha you know, have a lot of skill, but there's still a lot that they, you know, that they can add on to their game. So we're going to go ahead now. I mean, I think that you know, you've answered, you know, your, your credentials and just, you know, what it's like for you to do some of the scouting. And, and also I just even want to point out kudos to you, you know, for, for finding your, 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 your chi, if you will, finding what makes you happy because a lot of people stay in, in dead end positions, you know, they may make money, but they're not happy. So kudos to you for, for doing that. And then, and then allowing us, you know, to kind of pick your brain now as a result of your, of your happiness. I want to jump right in though. Listen, we all know who the top two selections are, but I, I think we want to get everyone's opinion. And when it, when it comes down to that, if you had the number one pick, who would you take and, and why? You know, it, it wasn't really as tough, a, you know, as tough as people made it seem out to be, you know, made it seem to be in this draft. Uh, you know, I understand where the appeal of Brandon Ingram was, but you can't pass up on a Ben Simmons type type of player, meaning he's just so unique um, that, you know, you don't know when another one is going to come, you know, another player like him is going to come around again, a Brandon Ingram type, you know, an athletic wing, the you know, wing, uh, who can knock down shots. You're going to find them every year. 
Uh, a six ten guy who can handle the ball has great vision. You know, makes good passes. Uh, can play in the post. Uh, you know, there's not many of them. There hasn't been many before, and there's not many you see coming coming uh, in the future pipeline at this point. So, uh, you know, you take Ben Simmons at one. You don't want to be the GM who passes on it. Now, whether he amounts to be what a lot of people think he will, you know, that's the big question. But uh, no, no GM is going to lose their job for taking a shot on Ben Simmons. Ed Isaacson joining us here on the Baseline NBA podcast. Be sure to check out his mock draft, which is available right now on NBC Sports slash Roto World. Second mock draft is up and ready to go, so be sure to check that out. And kind of catering off of that, you know, I often said to myself when the Cleveland when the Cleveland Cavaliers had Andrew Wiggins, and obviously, you know, they made the play to send him to Minnesota because they felt like the combination of LeBron James and Kevin Love and Kyrie Irving is what's going to get this Cavaliers and possibly if it, you know, if anything more than anything will get them this championship, bring promise to the organization for so long it's never won this. But I still say when you have a talent like an Andrew Wiggins, um, just simply because, you know, a great person like LeBron James is there, I, I just don't know if, whether or not it's worth squandering it when you compare him to maybe Kevin Love. If you're the Philadelphia 76ers, Ed, do you preemptively, knowing that you're going to make this selection, be it Ingram, be it, be it Simmons, are you already moving pieces around because you're going to make sure that his situation is right as he's a building block? Or are you basically going to stand fast after you make the selection and then kind of start driving at what you want to see happen with that organization? It just feels like Philadelphia is in a great position, but they can just easily find a way to mess this up if they do something preemptively or if they don't do something and they do something, I'm sorry, passively to after making a quality draft pick, whether it becomes Simmons or it becomes Ingram. You know, it's, this draft is sort of odd in that way because when we're looking at the top, um, whether it's Simmons or Ingram, you know, it's sort of bad luck for the teams who uh, ended up at the top of this draft because you're not, you know, you're not ending up with those sort of centerpiece kind of players, the kind of guys that you would build a team around. Um, so if you're a bad team, um, you're not going to find. Uh, you know, your savior in, the, in, in this group, uh, what Simmons and Ingram and a couple of the other guys in this, in this class are, are, are nice, you know, nice pieces to add to what you have already. So, you know, other than the fact that the Sixers, um, you know, for example, have this huge log jam in the front court already, um, I don't think picking Simmons really um, requires them um, to to do anything else right now, um, other than you know find the best way to fit him in uh, among you know the MB Noel Okafor trio right now, um, and then go to work on fixing that backcourt. Uh, you know, if Simmons was a Carl Towns type. Then it may be a little different. Then you're talking about a guy who uh, is could be your future, and then uh, so then you go to work trying to fit the guys around him. Uh, you know, the biggest thing with Simmons and Ingram, if they, you know, if that was to be the choice, is you don't have to go through all that. You you, you know, your only job is to t make the pick and then try to fit them in with what you have now. So basically, it feels like an extended, uh, an extended combine, so to speak. Whoever dra whoever gets drafted to play for the Philadelphia 76ers is 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 that is kind of the premise, right? Uh, you know, basically, it's it's you're just looking at, um, you know, yeah. And we're not saying these guys won't be stars or anything like that down the line, but um, you know, for the Sixers. Again, it it's you know this has been a, a you know a plan that's been in, in progress for a few years now. Uh, Simmons is just the next step in that plan, uh, and you know even though it's a different group in charge now, you know you, you just move forward 
you make you, you know you add the piece and you move forward from there looking for the next you know the next piece that you know that fits into the puzzle so barring anything unforeseen you know even going according to your to your mock draft unless the lakers do something just absolutely insane the hardest pick in the draft is probably three with Boston. And knowing that they don't necessarily want to keep it or whatever the case may be, you know, I think in your latest mock, you had them taking Bender. But Phoenix and Boston, two teams in very similar situations where they want to maybe trade those picks and, 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 and get somebody of, of more established value, if you will, from a veteran standpoint. But I guess my question really is in this situation, who is the next best actual player by by your estimation because you could very well see boston or even phoenix if you will maybe drafting said player like the Cavs did for wiggins if you will you know and ended up training him later on who's the next next best player regardless who that boston or even phoenix could maybe move on if they don't end up keeping them uh you know that's a little difficult because that's again one of the features of this draft is after that top two you then have you know just this this blob of players who are all very similar in, in their draft value. Um, you know, and the other way is you can look at it in, in a couple of different perspectives. Uh, you know, who is the best player right now? Um, uh, who, you know, who has the most potential out of the group? Uh, you know, who is the best at a particular position? Uh, you know, all different kinds of, you know, ways to, to look at that. You know, if you were to say, you know, who's the best guy right now who can come in and offer, you know, offer something to, to Boston? Uh, you know, the, the two guys are probably Chris Dunn and Buddy Heald. Uh, you know, two experienced guys from the college level um, who have, you know, particular skills that any team can use. Uh, you know, Heald with his shooting ability, Dunn with his ability, uh, at the point. Uh, but if you're saying, you know, who could be the best, uh, you know, in terms of potential, uh, then you're probably looking at a guy like Bender or a guy like Marquise Chris. Ed Eisen joining us here. You can catch him on Twitter at NBA draft blog. Ed, we, 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 we can see, like you were saying before, like after the first two, what we're talking about here is a toss up. Um, but with that being said, and, you know, not too long ago, Sean and I, we, you know, in our podcast, we did somewhat what we call as a, a draft re refix or remix, so to speak, of how the 2015 draft really should have played itself out when you look at how these guys played and respectively, you know, where they probably should have fell um, amongst the teams past, you know, the, 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 the first two picks, okay? In my mind, I'm looking at some of these guys and, and I'm saying to myself, wow, if they were with this team, I think they could instantly catapult not only their, their not just value, but their play and probably see themselves as being a significant contributor to a, to a team. When you look up and down that list, if a team was, was to get their draft pick right, you're looking at some the guys that you're looking at. Which one would you like to see on that team because you best feel like they are going to definitely contribute and help that basketball team, whether it's improve their wins, get them in the postseason, or possibly put them in a championship contention? Which, which player are you really looking at that we're not really talking about that can actually do that if they get that draft pick right? You know, the one that stands out right away is Milwaukee at 10 um, with – you know, I think sort of the general consensus among everyone is uh, Yaka Fertile from Utah, the big, you know, seven footer is, is, you know, he's not going to fall past them. And, you know, that sort of, you know, the Greg Monroe experiment didn't really work for them last year. And uh, Pearl can give them a guy who would fit in very easily with, you know, with the changes they're trying to make with putting Antetokounmpo at the point now, um, you know, Carl's ability in the pick and roll, um, get out, set screens, hit the offensive boards, um, and then on the defensive end, rebound, protect the rim, um, are all things that Milwaukee can use right away. And they're a team with a lot of young talent already uh, who's sort of poised to take that next step. So I think he's the guy who sort of stands out saying, uh, get him in there. Um, 
you know, by February, you know, don't be surprised if he's making some sort of impact as they're heading towards a playoff run. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about some guys that spent some time in college and, and you mentioned, you know, guys like Dunn and Heald already, but I want to talk about a guy like Denzel Valentine. You know, is he one of those players who just because he stayed in school for as long as he did and really took time to develop that, you know, people are sleeping on, can he really come in and be a true impact player no matter what situation he goes to? Um, no, that's never been sort of Valentine's thing is he's not, you know, his impact, his impact will be felt a little differently than I guess what, you know, how, you know, how most people, you know, tend to use that word. He's a guy who can come in and do a bit of everything. Um, so it's sort of hard to gauge, uh, the impact that he can make in a lot of ways, even though it's a different position, it's similar to. Is his old teammate Draymond Green? Uh, you know, the one thing going into into Green's draft is, you know, other than the athleticism questions that people had about him, is what exactly are you going to do with the guy? You know, what you know, how you know, how are we going to use him? Uh, in Valentine's case, it's a little more clear cut because this guy can shoot. Um, he can create off the dribble for himself for others, um, and even though he's not the most athletic guy in the world. He knows how to play defense. You know, Tom Izzo guys, by the time they leave Michigan State, whether they're a year or four years, um, the one thing they all know how to do is to play good defense. So, you know, he's not a guy who's going to come in and, you know, take a bad team and make them a playoff team. Uh, But he is the guy who is going to step in where, you know, with whatever you have and make them better. Ed Isaacson joining us here on the Baseline NBA podcast as we're talking 2016 NBA draft. Be sure to check out his mock draft that he has up. It's on NBC Sports slash Roto World. You can also catch him on NBADraftBlog.com. He is the brain trust. So what you don't see on on Roto World, you will definitely catch on NBADraftBlog.com. Um, Ed you know, as I'm looking at your mock draft, and 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 I think it's an impressive draft at that as well, too. Um, one thing that I do find interesting, and, and we kind of talk about a team like the Toronto Raptors, who they they pretty much have put themselves in a position where it's going to come down to they're either going to have to make some moves. Masai Uri is going to have to make some moves to really put keep this and maintain this team ele- you know, to try and elevate them past the Cleveland Cavaliers. And we still talk about how teams like the Pistons and even the Milwaukee Bucks should expectably be better teams moving forward. And you had selected possibly Jalen Brown to go um, to the Toronto Raptors. I was just interested in, in, in the idea of the precipice. You know, the Toronto Raptors are a team that I think is a perimeter shot away from being marketably better offensively and then you were saying a little bit in, in the explanation that DeMar DeRozan might not possibly be with this team next year. He could possibly sign elsewhere. If DeMar DeRozan were to sign elsewhere, would it be inconceivable that the Toronto Raptors would try to make a play to push themselves up, maybe to try and snag a Buddy Heel type player? Because I feel like, to your point, this team just needs to shoot the basketball better. And if you've got NBA-ready shooters and they have the means to be able to push that and they don't want to do it via through free agency – could you see them pops possibly trying to make a play to move upward to get someone like Buddy Yield? Um, yeah, I guess it's always possible. I think what more people are trying to do and who have these lottery picks is trying to get out of it um, just because the players aren't there. Um, and when you're, when you're a team like Toronto, sort of like we discussed with Boston, you know, even getting a Buddy Yield, you know, even with his ability to sort of give you something right away, He's not instantly going to make a team that was the second seed in the East that much better. Uh, you know, they may be better off taking that nine pick um, and getting out and trying to find, you know, a, a young player who's somewhat established who can shoot the ball already um, on another team for someone who may be interested in. Um, I think my latest mock, I had, you know, uh, Scalapissier going at number nine to Toronto, um, you know, say someone's interested in, in, in his potential. Um, and they have, you know, sort of a, you know, a, a, a young shooter who doesn't really fit in with what they're doing. Um, 
you know, then it may, I think it's more likely we may see them go the other way with that um, and try and get it out of that, you know, try and uh, deal down. So we've talked a lot about, you know, kind of healed even in, in passing, if you will, but outside of him, you know, who are the next, I say, maybe two or three best shooters in the draft? Because I think he's being kind of heralded as, okay, the best shooter, you know, pure shooter in, in, in this in this current draft. But who are some of the guys that you're looking at, you know, outside of Heal, if you're looking for that specific skill set guys can kind of target? Uh, well, Heal and, and, and Jamal Murray are probably like 1A and 1B, um, it, you know, in terms of the top shooter in this draft. Um, you know, I guess, you know, there was a story in Boston last week. Um, you know, Murray went in and hit, you know, 79 out of 100 threes or something like that, um, which set, like, uh, the Boston workout record. Uh, and then a day or two later, Heald came in and hit 83 or 84 or something like that. So, I mean, just um, outrageous numbers in terms of shooting ability uh, between the two of them. Um, you know, the problem, I mean, Heald, I think, answered a little, you know, a few more of uh, the questions people had about him at the combine in terms of, uh, you know, he measured a legitimate 6'5", um, and, you know, wingspan, all that sort of checked out. Murray is a little different. He's probably barely 6'4", uh, not the most athletic guy in the world, but uh, he can shoot. Um, we saw that uh, the second half of the season at Kentucky. Uh, you know, after them, you know, Wade Baldwin at the point guard position, uh, you know, hit over 40% from three last year. Uh, so he's probably one of the better ones among the point guards. Uh, Furkan Korkmaz out of Turkey, uh, 18-year-old. Uh, you know, already at his age, he's just getting better and better with his shooting ability and um, is the kind of guy who can, uh, you know, three, four years down the road, you know, wouldn't be surprised if he's one of the top shooters in the league. Um but other than, other than that, you know, it's not it's not the deepest group of shooters uh, this year. Malik Beasley, a freshman out of Florida State, he's probably on that list. Um, and yeah, so that'd probably be the top four or five shooters in this draft. And a um, couple more questions before you know we we let you get out of here. How what is what do you feel like um, you know really from the people that you've spoken with in your ability to develop the mock draft and stuff, what is the pulse really like? I I, th I feel like a, a lot of it is tempered down simply because of the fact that we're expecting this to be more predicated on moves to be made by general managers. And to your point, you know, uh, uh, it sounds like there's a lot of possibility of teams trading down. And I don't know if whether or not that's necessarily a bad thing. I, you would think that movement of volatility in reference to the draft might actually be a good thing. But, I mean, could that be a mark against the talent pool because of the uncertainty that we're looking at? So I'm just trying to get a feel of what the temperament is really like. Is there really an exciting buildup for this upcoming draft on, on the prospects and, and, and where some of these kids are truly landing? Um, well, here's the thing is, I'm not a huge fan, and I know a lot of other people aren't, of the, you know, the lottery talent this year. But once you get from that mid-first to mid-second round, there's a lot of uh, not only talent, but talent that is uh, you know, more on, on the ready side of being able to contribute right away um, with, with uh, you know, also a nice mix of of young players who can still develop a lot more. Uh, so it's really a case where, you know, a lot, it's a lot that the rich will get richer because these guys, a lot of these guys are going to fall to teams that are already playoff teams. Uh, and, you know, they're just going to keep adding, you know, adding more assets uh, to try and stay ahead of, you know, some of these young cores like Milwaukee, Minnesota, um, and, you know, you know, because that's you know, some of these teams will make a, you know will make a move forward um, in the next few years, uh, but you know the teams that are already in the playoffs. I think a lot of them are sort of happy at some of these choices they're going you know that they may have 
you know, say, if, you know, if you're Indiana at 20, um, you know, 20 is, you know, it's not usually a place you, you're going to find a whole lot of impact players. But I think this year they're going to find someone who uh, can help them moving forward. Uh, same with Atlanta at 21, um, you know, the Clippers and San, even San Antonio and Golden State um, at the end of the first round. Uh, you know, they have flexibility because they, they have such great development systems, including their D-League teams, um, that, you know, they can go in any kind of direction where normally at 29 or 30, teams are just hoping someone falls to them, where San Antonio or Golden State can, can be a, more, you know, a little more flexible and say, um, no, we can take a chance on someone because, um, you know, we have the system in place to get these guys ready by the time we need them. Uh, you saw Golden State with Kevon Looney. Uh, you know, San Antonio has, uh, you know, gotten a lot of credit for how they developed Corey Joseph um, over the years and, you know, saw in the playoffs with the Raptors. He's come a long way, and a lot of that came from his development time with the Spurs. So, yeah, I think there is, you know, there is some, you know, sort of excitement about the players, even if they don't stand out in a particular way, uh, because the way things are viewed from a fan perspective is different than um, how things are viewed from a, a team perspective. Teams just want someone who's going to help them win games. Uh, it doesn't matter if guys know who they are, um, if they're going to be exciting in any way. Uh, while fans you know, they want names, you know, they want who's going to be the next star. And, you know, you're not going to find a lot of that in this draft. So it's going to cause a lot of people to say, this is a down draft or, uh, you know, any other kind of negative connotation. So instant gratification is not something that I guess a lot of teams are going to be able to get in this. So if you're looking at the developmental process for some of these guys, you know, I, I want your opinion on one guy in particular, but then really just kind of maybe even just two names that, that jump out to you. Thon Maker is a guy that I, I'd love to get your opinion on. And then just two guys that even from your last comment there, like, you know, when you see from 25 to 35 or whatever it is in, into the second round, who are some of those other guys who you're like, you know what, they could really provide some value, on the, especially if they get some time to develop? Uh, well, Thon Maker is, you know, his story is sort of well known at this point. And, and definitely intriguing when you have that size, the emerging skill, um, and the fact that he just plays with a lot of energy on the floor. Uh, but, you know, we're not really sure how much more he's going to develop. Even at his age, um, you know, he's sort of leveled off a bit in terms of how he's developed. And a lot of his development over the years has just been handled completely wrong. Um, you know, the stuff with his guardian, mentor, whatever he is, um, has really ruin the kid in terms of uh, developing him the right way. Uh, but from a draft point of view, he's, you know, it, it, he's intriguing. Um, you're not going to expect him um, to do a lot. And I don't think you want to pick someone like him in a position um, where, you know, where there's some risk where you could do, where you could obviously do better. But once you get into that late first round, you know, 25 on into the early second, you know, you, the risk is minimal at that point of getting up, you know, of making a bad pick. Um, so, I mean, there's a chance you can see him there, though I'm not expecting a whole lot of, from him in the future. Okay. And then final one before I let you get out of here is the person that you think has the biggest chance or the most chance of jumping up in the draft and the guy who could slip the most in the draft? Yeah, you know, one guy to sort of watch out for, um, you know, as we get closer to draft day is Isaiah Whitehead. Um, he's a guy, again, teams are definitely uh, sort of, in, you know, really like his talent, the way he plays, the competitiveness, um, but a lot like uh, Lance Stevenson, who also came out of Whitehead's old high school, uh, you know, it can sometimes just be a mess watching him play. Um, 
But, you know, I think a lot of teams have the idea that put him in the right environment, that you'll really be able to get the best out of him. Um, so I know some people are thinking maybe the late second round, maybe mid second round. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see him by, by next Thursday go in the end of the first round. Uh, now in terms of guys slipping, um, you know, we've already seen sort of a big shift against Tyler Eulis at this point, who some were, you know, touting for, you know, the 15 to 20 range uh, between, you know, the supposed red flag on it, you know, because of a hip issue uh, and the size really starting to get to guys. Uh, there's a good chance he's going to end up from where three weeks ago he was considered maybe mid first, now being a mid second. He is the man. Uh, you can catch him. He is the brain trust for NBA Draft Blog. Uh, dot com analyst scout also major contributor for NBA uh, NBC Sports Roto World Ed Isaacson man Ed we really appreciate you jumping on board with us this week getting our mind right getting us prepped up which listen maybe to the fans it might not seem like it's going to be an exciting draft but there are some definite names on that board that I'm going to be eyeing for to find out where they're going to fall and I'm going to say I owe it all to Ed for pointing this in the right direction about what we're going to see transpire come this week oh, it was great talking to you guys anytime yes indeed man Shaw listen this is why you know I'm so proud of our podcast man um you know I listen everybody believes that NBA analysts, scouts, that they're these are guys, these are guys you gotta like they gotta be on ESPN or they gotta be, you know, on basketball insiders. You know what? You can go to any particular site, but when someone who is dedicated to doing something that he loves and he basically starts from the bottom up and can give you the kind of insight that we're getting with reference to what we should be looking forward to from some of these picks, it's really, really helpful and beneficial. And if you're someone who's watching and who's listening and reading and all of these other you know avenues that you're taking these are things that you should be looking for because it's almost exactly the kind of things that you're expecting the general managers the executives from those organizations to be considering when they're looking at the possible draft picks and lottery selections that are going to take place come this week yeah kudos to ed for coming on and you know being honest about his career path number 1 and then you know giving some true insight on on the draft and and what could potentially happen um i hope our listeners definitely you know feel enlightened as it definitely i know i do after speaking with him and you know there's just so many things we could have talked about because the draft is so even really after that kind of top 2 you know so many different guys we could have asked him about this guy that guy whatever the case may be we just didn't have enough time and but nonetheless again another great guest and hopefully he'll come on again yeah you and, and here's the thing, Sean, I know I didn't get an opportunity to ask him this question, but maybe I'll ask you because I want to get your temperament and your feel about this. You know, the last couple of years, it seems like the, per the, the perception of the draft seems to be very top heavy. But even when we've done our refix, when we've done our remix, so to speak, you look up and down and guys that we didn't get, get to talk about or if we had done a draft show we probably didn't make much mention of them, have come in and have considerably, have, have made contributions considerably. And when you look at the list of talent that's available here again, what's dominating the headlines are the top two players. And then nobody's really making much discussion of anything regarding the bottom feed. But maybe uh, that is a testament more to if some of these guys come in under good systems, if these guys come into situations that already are on an uptick, they are going to instantly have opportunities to help contribute and make those teams marketably better. And that is really what it's all about. I mean, I think that's the, the case every year. You know, teams trying to get a fit um, and, a, and a system players going into a system that suits them and their ability to develop. You know, Ed's point about certain guys may potentially maybe going to, uh, sorry, going to Golden State or to San Antonio. Um, it really is proof positive because they'll have an opportunity. Yeah, they won't get all, a ton of minutes right away, but they're going to learn how to become NBA professionals and, and learn how to hone their craft. And I think especially in a situation like San Antonio, you know, where some of the older guys now are, are, are exactly that. They're older and they're not trying to play as many minutes. You might get a little bit more playing time in, in, in a great system, but but I've never seen a draft, at least in, that I can really remember, where the, the the number 14 pick could very easily be the number 35 pick 
or something like that. You know what I mean? There's, yeah. there's such a wide range for, for, for guys to go, um, you know, 15, 20 different slots as opposed to like, okay, you kind of know these guys, this is like the kind of top 20. I don't think we necessarily have that this year. And, you know, guys that, you know, you look at like a Malachi Richardson who we had on the show recently, a guy like Bryce Johnson, uh, a guy like Henry Ellison, uh, uh, even uh, uh, Zubak, the Croatian center, that, that you just have no idea. <laughs> they could go so, so far. Uh, even Wade Baldwin, who he mentioned in, 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 when we had him on the show too, just I, I just find that to be so intriguing. And that's what makes, I think, Thursday's draft so, 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 so much more watchable for me because it's just like, well, what's really going to happen here? Yeah, and listen, let's also start giving a little bit of credit to these organizations. They, they are stepping up and they're doing what's necessary to make their teams better without the excuse of the expense of saying, well, we don't have enough money to get marquee players, um, you know, uh, prior to the the, the, up, the upgrade, which we'll probably talk about in the coast to coast regarding the NBA salary cap. I understand everybody's temperament is fixated on, I'm sorry, I used the word temperament like 50 times, but I, I'm sure everybody is completely fixated on, well, if the cap is going to be set amount, then that means we should automatically be going after said players. And what I think is for, is being forgotten here is even if you get that said player, it doesn't mean that the rest of your team is going to be and uh, there's going to be a significant upgrade. There still has to be accountability on the the players that you're putting around those those free agent talents that you're bringing in there. If you have any expectations to be competitive in this league, we've seen the formula already play itself out for San Antonio. We're now seeing it come to fruition for the Golden State Warriors. Teams like the Cleveland Cavaliers who have lucked themselves into a situation where you come and get back the best player in the game of basketball and who could be still the most dominant player in the game of basketball helps make your team marketably better. But we see how much of an affluence he has on guys like Kyrie Irving, who is supposed to be your cornerstone player, is now learning from greatness as, as another building stone player. Some of these teams really have to get it in their mind that they have to start leaning on the talent that they're drafting to pick it up and, and get into get into NBA mode very quickly. If you have any kind of expectations down the road that you're thinking of getting free agent talent to come there, because one thing is for certain for some of these generation, our generational players, they're not going to sit there and idly wait around while you're still trying to figure out if that guy is that guy. Yeah. And the other thing, I think another point to even add to that too is, Teams like Phoenix, teams like Boston, Philadelphia, Denver, who have multiple picks in the first round, you know, that's guaranteed money they're going to have to pay these guys if, if they were to come on over. So I think you may see, you're going to see them feverishly trying to dump some of these picks, packaging them, packaging them with maybe one or two of their veterans that are on their roster to try to get more established stars, if you will, so they don't have to develop so much young talent. Maybe not so much in the case of Philadelphia. You know, maybe they want to get more actual NBA players on their roster this year. But I definitely think when you're looking at Denver, Phoenix, and Boston, they're really going to be trying to do things. Or their 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 contrary uh, decision to that will be doing the San Antonio moving in in the in the in the sorry in the in the draft and stash you know trying to take european guys who aren't ready to come over right away and then put, keeping them overseas for a little while so they can develop over there before you bring them over because having these picks now means again it means guaranteed salary in the first round and that's why you see boston and philly also they have multiple picks on the second round where the, when the, where the salaries aren't guaranteed so i just feel like there's going to be so much movement and so much wheeling and dealing at least there's going to be attempted wheeling and dealing with this with these draft picks especially for the guys who have multiple picks all right so one thing that we excuse me one thing that we didn't have an opportunity to speak to ed about which i'm, I'm sure you were chomping at the bit but we can just quickly just throw it out there is you know who is the best Euro that we should be keeping our eye out for in this upcoming draft? You know, we've thrown out the name Demasis Sabonis. You know, obviously the Sabonis clan, so to speak, has been uh, has has been a mainstay in in the NBA community, NBA talks. So the fact that his name is being thrown out there is probably you know one of the sought out uh, bigs, the front court players, so to speak in this upcoming draft could be someone like you were saying before. He could easily be a top 10 pick or he can easily be someone at the bottom, you know, a, 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 a bottom of the draft. But who in your estimation do you find to be the most intriguing Euro selection that we should be looking out for? Well, I, I still think it, it has to be, you know, Dragon Bender one way or the other. But I mean, outside of out of Bender, you know, who I think he, he even did mention was uh, Korkamaz or whatever. I can never can say his name right. Uh, Furkan, you know, the Turkish guard who's supposed to be one of the best shooters in this draft. There's also, again, I think I mentioned Zubak a little bit earlier in the Croatian center. Um, and and I, um, guy's name is escaping me right now. 
uh, um, Lu- Luau, the French, oh, the t- French guy. Timothy, Timothy Luau. Yeah, yeah, the the French, the French swingman too. A guy who I think on one podcast and one show was being compared to some potentially a Nicholas Batum type player. I think those are the top guys that you're looking at when you're thinking about from the international waters, if you will, and coming over to to the NBA this season. Um, but if I had a pick, and even kind of what I was asking, you know, uh, Ed on on the podcast, if 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 I'm the Celtics going back to number three, I think Bender is a guy that probably gives you the most flexibility if you're quote unquote stuck taking the pick, um, especially if you get him and not to say that people are going to drool over him in summer league. But if he goes, has a good summer league or where the case may be, maybe that's a trade that you can make, you know, for him moving down the line, you know, after, especially if you don't sign him right away. Um, I think he's the one who has the most upside and the most value from the international waters. A billion names, a billion characters, so many of them, and we'll probably need to get our linguistics books out by the time it's all said and done. But this upcoming NBA draft, definitely one to watch for. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how these organizations are going to line themselves up, whether to move up, move down, move around, in and out. Wherever these players land, it's definitely going to be must-watch TV end of this week. My man, Shaw, and I are just so appreciative of having our man, Ed Isaacson, on. And we appreciate you and yours for catching this segment of The Breakdown as we talk NBA Draft 2016. This is Cal Lee, Warren Shaw of the Baseline NBA Podcast. and you have just been broken down. Time now for the drop, Cal Lee, Warren Shaw of the Baseline NBA Podcast. And, oh man, you know, I thought we were going to try to avoid this, this question. But maybe it's best that we do it in the off season Because we certainly don't want to be doing it during the regular season. We probably would start a lynch mob with this thing, man. Just, But listen, man, it has to be thrown out there. Is the NBA rigged? Is there is there a dedicated conspiracy going on, you know, amongst the league to assure games to be continued, whether it be a finals, a playoff? Is 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 are we looking at this like eight men out? Are we looking at this like the ringer? Are we looking like are, are, are basically is everybody? That's wearing stripes or related or a part of the Tim Donahue family tree, man. I, Shaw, I don't know, but I guess the question really comes down to is the NBA rigged? Yeah, I, I don't think it is, but I definitely understand fans, you know, from their outside perspective, um, definitely thinking that certain things uh, are, are questionable. And definitely when I was a little bit younger, you know, um, and, and more of a fan than I am, analyst or uh, media type, if you will, for the NBA, like we are now. Uh, I definitely felt like that 2000, I think it was 2001 at Western Conference Finals was rigged, and that's the one that your man here, Don, he was a, was a part of, and he's and he said it was. Um, that 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 hurt, you know, that hurt to think that the game that I that I've loved ever since I was young um, could be not uh, on, uh, completely on the up and up, and have some disingenuous attitudes and 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 mantra and rules that are taking place within it. Um, but I think the NBA has cleaned a lot of it, that stuff up, if you will. Um, and I don't necessarily think that we're, we're in a rigged situation right now. Although I do understand that any time that game is being uh, officiated by, by humans with human error, uh, that there's always going to be some questions where, where, that, where that when that comes up. But I, I'm not on the, on the boat that the NBA is rigged. What about you? Let's put it like this. I don't like the word rigged. Because when you use the word rigged, you, you're talking about a, a, a decisive intent to change the outcome unknowingly with two teams that are playing to determine an outcome, one being a winner and one being a loser. You are decisively intending to change an outcome that's, that favors you personally more so than it matters whether it favors everybody else, Okay. Like if you're if you're Tim Donahue, you're doing it for your benefit, right? Because your benefit is is that you're relying on some other guy, some broker, someone that you funneled money to, someone that you're 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 paying a, a bookie, a loan shark, or whatever the case may be. It's still self-serving your purpose. I'd, I'd like to think that the NBA is not intending to rig games on that level that we're saying. Well, they're trying to get ratings or anything like that. But I will say, though, that the NBA has made 
a very concerted effort to be very inconsistent with how you are viewing and objectively critiquing the game. And that trickles down from the fans all the way to the referees who are helping to determine the outcome of these games. And it, it goes back to what I have been basically complaining about, Shaw, since the, the playoffs. You've seen me throw it out there on the tweets. This NBA playoffs has been really one of the most grotesque officiated playoffs I have ever seen. And it's not because I'm saying these guys are blind as a bat. What are they looking at? It's not about what they're looking at. It's what they're refusing to call. It's because of the inconsistency that they've shown, where in the regular season, you're calling it up and down to the point where people are complaining about the flow and the pace of the game. And then all of a sudden now, because it's the NBA playoffs, because there's a level of intrigue and the matchups and all this other kind of stuff, and because of this specific crew, like you had mentioned before in our post-game discussion, we're talking about the fact that they're going to call it one way, but the other guys don't call it. This is exactly the reason why the MLB is in the predicament that they're in right now with the way the game is being played. Because we may enjoy human error, but we don't enjoy human arrogance. And there are times where human arrogance takes over and diminishes and demoralizes your ability to have fun watching something because your eyes were never preset to see that all the way through an NBA season. And then all of a sudden, in critical games like the playoffs is when it's suddenly now being called or not called. That to me is where I feel the word rigged is being thrown out there. And I don't think it's the proper word, but it's an understandable word just simply because you shouldn't do it in that kind of manner. It shouldn't be that kind of way. Yeah, well, put it this way. The NBA is not upset if they get an opportunity, you know, to force a game six or game seven in NBA finals or any playoff series. You know what I mean? Because it is it is what it is. It's more marketing dollars. You know, it's 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 more advertisement. Um, it, it's more at the gate for fans coming to the games, et cetera, et cetera. They're they're not upset about those things. So like, let's not get that twisted. But you know, I just have a hard time feeling like okay that they that they that they want to 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 have a product that that can be so so tainted. You know, by having their own influence and self interest uh, being so apparent, if you will. Clearly, there are teams that they like to have out there and that they are going to get more shot and more pub because those teams and those players uh, bring in more money. Again, same for the advertising, the watchability, your ratings, and, and, and all of those things, too. But, you know, I think they often try to do a great job when small market teams a few years ago when Memphis Grizzlies made it to the Western Conference Finals, you know, they try to sell that and say, hey, hey, look, you know what I mean? This is a team that did it the right way, per se, per se. But they weren't excited about that because the, fa- the Memphis fan base doesn't permeate throughout the United States and throughout, you know, the, the rest of the world, if, if you will. But the Lakers, teams like that, that sells. Even LeBron going to Cleveland, that, that now sells because LeBron is LeBron. He's an entity and a business and that of himself. Um, so I definitely don't feel like they have issues when things get extended, if you will. Um, but even when you go back to thinking about the, the draft lottery, there, there have been some really, wow, that was ironic that it happened that way moments, I think, with, with the draft lottery. And now they've tried to be more uh, transparent in that process as well, too. So I think the league itself, and Adam Silver especially, is that's his word specifically. They want transparency in, in, in their dealings and their inner workings. But Which I think is the wrong word. I don't like the word transparency at all because that, transparency is not the problem for the NBA. Transparency is what you do when someone uses another ne- negative word in this case, rigged, in this game, in this case, fixed, when you have a referee, someone who is an ambassador preset amongst the NBA officials, not the NBA commissioner, preset among the NBA officials that is officiating, helping to decide the outcome of games. When that gets thrown out there, then you have to use words like transparency. But I don't think transparency has ever been the issue for the NBA. It's consistency, which is something that David Stern has been often criticized for. And I'd hate to see that now happen with Adam Silver because Adam Silver is really doing a great job, but because now he's fixated on using the word transparency, he loses me because this type of transparency does not fix the inconsistency that we still keep seeing, that we still keep criticizing about with regards to the NBA. Yeah, and, but it's 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 definitely a, a a multifaceted question because I think with officiating, there's there's no question it hasn't been what they've wanted it to be. Um, I don't think Silver or anybody in, in, in the higher up of the league office can say, okay, that this was a well-officiated NBA playoffs um, at all. 
And then, and, and, but thus, again, it even goes back to the other things too. When you talk about rig fixed or whatever the case would be, does the NBA have its own interests at heart as opposed to letting things really play itself out? That goes back to more questions again with the draft lottery and, and how that, how that, that happens too. So for me, uh, I look at it, you know, from all those facets and I just say, well, you know what? I do feel like there are, there are some things that are definitely in random, but there are some things where human error is more than it, than more is more than it should be. And then more that should even be acceptable at times. And the NBA in their own transparency and strive for consistency need to be better at addressing some of those things, especially when it comes to the overall officiating and, you know, having that point system. I know, I think we talked about it on earlier when the Heat were still in the playoffs and Gabriel Union shit went off about, well, why don't they get evaluated um, in terms of being uh, being punished, you know, for not making the right calls? Just like, hey, hey, CL, you made a bad call. It's a slap on the wrist. Okay, don't do it again. No, there needs to be something in play where these guys can continue to make bad calls and impact games with their bad officiating. I completely agree with you. But again, in or let's put it like this. In order to in order for there to be trans transparency, there needs to be transition and transgression. And then transparency will seem a little bit more clear to the NBA fan, to the NBA consumer, more importantly, to anyone who continues to enjoy watching the sport continue to grow. You're tuned to the baseline, Cal Lee, Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. And this was the drop. Coast to coast. Coast, 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 to coast. Time now to go coast to coast discussing the news in the association. You ready to rock and roll, Mr. Shaw? Absolutely, man. Let's ride. All right. The trade rumors are already swirling. And, uh, you know, of course, man, Derrick Rose got to be in the midst of it. I mean, he is going to be a free agent come next season. If you're the Chicago Bulls, you might want to try and get something because you probably won't get anything by the time this season ends. So the New York Knicks have been in discussions about possibly acquiring the former NBA MVP. Are you liking this kind of matchup with uh, the Knicks and the Bulls possibly doing doing some business? Look at Phil Jackson, man. You know, fr- you know, fresh out of the woods of Philly Montana fan. or Wyoming or wherever the hell he is. He out there now. He's the only out there one from out of the mountainside. I know. You know what I mean? And trying to assure or sorry, sure up their, their point guard or their guard situation. Listen, if they acquire Rhodes, depending on what quote unquote assets they give up for him. Um, mean more it, trade picks? Oh no. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no. You don't want uh, you don't want to do that to Nick fans. It's it's again, if they're not giving up much for him, um, and then you know, and they may even have to get a third team involved. Um, I think it's an acceptable risk, especially for a year. Um, you know, for a team that obviously wants to have have a star but also play or somebody else with Carmelo and be able to get him the ball Rose was decent at penetrating and, and passing a little bit um, you know, struggled playing alongside Butler at times too so we've talked about on the previous show in terms of you know, who do they, who they, who the Bulls rather give up and it's definitely not Butler they'd rather give up Rose so here come the Knicks now calling and at least investigating the situation let's see if it comes to fruition yeah man talk about a conundrum I, I'd really be interested to see how this plays out and what would transpire because if neither team gets it right I mean talk about the scrutiny uh, because of where those teams sit in their markets. All right, Shaw. Now, speaking of Chicago, they're not waiting around for Derrick Rose to start already doing a sweep of this this, this roster. They trade Cameron Barristow for Spencer Dinwiddie. I believe Dinwiddie was part of the Pistons organization. But the Bulls, nonetheless, they wind up getting another dude with a very interesting last name and trading off their man Barristow. I feel like the names themselves should be the next guys on the come up for the West Texas Investors Club. You're a wild dude, but um, <laughs> you know, with Chicago, I think they're definitely trying to get some some scoring punch off the bench. Um, you know, Aaron Brooks was, I mean, Aaron Brooks. You know, he does he does what he does, but you know, I'm not sure about his contract situation, whether or not he'll be back. Um, and Bear Style was just um, a, a guy who couldn't really get into the into the rotation for them. But it's an interesting move because you know that Noah and uh, Gasol are both potentially leaving the organization, and not that that Cameron is a guy that you're going to play and, and give plus minutes per se, but he definitely would give you a little bit of depth at that position so they guess how they have some some something else maybe in the works but i think we are starting to see from what we predicted in in, in our, one of our previous shows as well too that the chicago bulls team is going to be a lot different in 2016 2017 no question all right the word is dmc is running um i know people have got that little slogan out no run dmc but hey man dmc is running and he has already lost 20 pounds in this offseason so are we going to see a diesel up boogie cousins 
Hitman, DMC is a, is, is a fan favorite of mine, as you, as you know. And of course. Love to, love to get him on the show one day, but Cousins out Plug. there working hard, you know, trying to get ready for USA basketball as he's pretty much assured his spot. Going out there looking svelte, losing 20 pounds already. I'm a little concerned. Oh, I mean, I know he's the svelte word. Uh, yeah, yeah I'm, but I'm a little concerned. I mean, I mean, I know he's got the nutritionist and all the, the, the great trainers around him, but it hasn't been that long. So I just feel like losing 20 pounds and, and what has it been? I guess a month and a half, two months. I think that's I don't a know, lot. It's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. So it's a lot. So we'll, we'll see if those reports are actually true. But um, hopefully Cousins is taking, you know, taking care of himself. He's trying to lose some weight. So he's not putting so much pressure on his knees and his feet and his back. Um, and I, I, I like to see that he's moving in the right direction. I just hope it doesn't mean more flops. Oh, uh, Boogie Cousins is too dominant of a player for him to be flopping. He's already doing enough flopping as it is. You lose 20 pounds. And we're gonna see a lot of we're gonna see a lot of acting from my man Boogie Cousins. And listen, I don't know too many too many brothers with that many tattoos walking a red carpet and you know with Academy Award winners. So you know we gotta be careful. We gotta watch that. We gotta see how that all transpires. Um, I don't even know, Shaw, whether or not this is a dignified situation for us to bring up, just simply because you know I like for us to keep positive. We had a really positive show. But another unfortunate circumstance with NBA professionals, NBA players caught up in bad situations. And now it's Darren Collinson. Um, You know, reports are that he is being charged with domestic violence. You know, again, another scenario, another situation where, you know, professional players, man, they they are just caught in in what's not. Listen, ultimately, something is going to happen. Ultimately, there's going to be some form of uh, suspension or punishment. It's just not a good look. Um, and I feel bad because Darren Collinson is really, you know, he's, he's a great player. So it's hard to imagine that he's found himself in this situation with regards to charges to domestic violence. Come on, DC, do right, man. Listen, you know, there, there's no, no place in that. We don't know all the details and, you know, all, all the, all, all everything that that's involved in this situation. But, uh, we definitely don't want to see any of our, our, our NBA players or any, any guys, anybody involved in domestic violence one way or the other. So especially when you're in the limelight, like, like he is, and that, that topic is something that seems to be permeating throughout the sports landscape. You just, it, that you just feel like you would, you would not do it in general for, for, for that reason alone, and let alone the fact that it's just not even right. So hopefully DC, you know, gets whatever, uh, you know, help he needs and gets out of this situation, you know, and, and becomes a better person that absorb it and you know obviously we 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 we, our thoughts and prayers out you know to his girlfriend or whatever the case may be and hopefully that she's okay as well all right now shaw finally to end on a good note i mean it's as good a note as you can if you're working for the nba or if you're part of an nba organization or team but like i said before when the nba salary cap will be at a nice lumpy 94 million money 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 ching you know what i'm saying i mean seriously man Teams are going to be looking pretty nice. I'm sorry, players are going to be feeling pretty nice if that kind of money is going to get passed around for this NBA salary cap. Yeah, man, that's it's, it's a great look for if you're, if you're a free agent this year and even a better look if you're going to be a free agent next summer. Um, you know, yeah, there's money to be had out there. So you're an, uh, an average or middling guy. Jacob Jeweler is back, baby. Jacob Jeweler is back. You know what I mean? You're going to be able to bank out and those 12 and $15 million contracts, when you think about guys like Chandler Parsons who signed you know, a year ago, that that was going to look like pennies because now Parsons can you know get up to eighteen or twenty million dollars you know under these new rules, if you will. So, um, but the max guys, you know, would like you're looking at a contract that could be upwards of worth thirty million, you know, a year for a guy like LeBron James or something like that. Right. This now. is That's why it's going to be. Just, it's just why it's going to be so important. Like we've never put much emphasis. We always put emphasis on the players going out and playing the game. But because now this kind of money is being floated around amongst these NBA organizations, big and small market. The emphasis now is making sure that you have the right executives in place to make the right basketball decisions because the wrong one could set teams back for a good three to four years because we're, there's no question there are going to be players that are going to get overpaid. So we don't know whether or not their right. value is going to be worth the money that they're getting. Yeah, and the other thing too is something to definitely watch out for is those teams that don't typically like to spend um, and remember, you have until, you know, season's end to get to the minimum salary floor, if you will. Um, but the Philadelphia is out there. The Memphis is out there. You know, those teams that don't always have uh, high payrolls, they're going to have to figure out a way now to continue to up. Because now with the salary going up, that means the floor went up, too. So you have to get some you have to pay these guys, you know, what they're worth or maybe even, you know, more than what they're worth, if you will, just so that you don't get get dinged the other way as opposed to going over the luxury tax. Definitely, man. But look, awesome show this week man uh i i believe i'm ready i know you're ready i'm hoping our nba uh our baseline nba podcast listeners and fans are ready for the nba draft and listen 
just an awesome show getting our man Ed Isaacson on board from NBADraftBlog.com and Roto World to help us give us some insight on guys that we really should be looking forward to blowing up the spot. Uh, Thursday is going to be their night, man, and I, I think we kind of set the table, set the stage a little bit to get everybody geared up on who they should be looking at. Yeah, we absolutely did, and just right now following that, we got to jump right into free agency, so all the big names and heavy hitters that are coming on to that, and following that, we'll have Summer League as well, so it's going to be a busy summer here, as always, on The Baseline. Hopefully you stay tuned in with us. Make sure you give us a rating, and rate us a review, iTunes, Stitcher, all your social media outlets. Please make sure you're, you're tuning in with us and, and giving us your feedback. Definitely. So for The Baseline, Cal Lee, Warren Shaw, we appreciate you guys. You know we do, and we'll catch up with you next time.